So we'll, we'll, jump into, we'll jump into God's Word here, and we'll see what He has to say for us tonight. I've been really enjoying uh, these last couple of weeks, and uh, preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, red wall, red letter, and just seeing what Jesus has to say about how we should be living, and it's been, uh, I wish He would have taught us something about it, the soundboard. That would have been, there's no section about the soundboard, so the whole thing crashed like five minutes before the service started, and then... Uh, then the air conditioning, on, you know, this has got two air conditioning systems in this place, you know, and the one that goes this way down this side is broken now. That broke today. So that was, that was pleasant, you know, it was just really. So if I actually ignite into flames while I'm up here, you'll know why, because uh, I'm already just scorching hot. So um, maybe I should bring some of my blood pressure pills right up here with me, right? <laughs> oh, I love you guys. Well, let's... Uh, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to be conformed into the image of Christ, right? That's the goal. And so every time you come here, we should be moving ever closer to that. So are you guys ready to move one step closer for God's goal for your life? You ready to do that? All right. So let's open up our Bible then to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to be studying in verse 27 through 30 uh, this evening. And uh, this, this section of scripture is, is not... Uh, I mean, this isn't divine, this part where it says this, it says teaching about adultery. I don't know what your Bible says. Mine says teaching about adultery, but it's, um, what is it? Lust. About lust. What, anybody else have a title there in their Bible? What does it say? I see, I mean, that, that means people don't have their Bible open. Oh, all right, there we go. Lust, anything else? Huh? All right, so um, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this section to you. But if you're not much of a Bible reader, I think most of you guys are. I know, most, I know all you guys. You're all Bible readers. But if you weren't, this would be kind of a, a weird text right here, you know, because of some of the things that Jesus says. But by God's grace, we'll achieve some clarity before we leave here uh, tonight. So let's go ahead and read this, and then we'll, we'll see what it has to say for us here tonight, okay? So starting in verse 27, Matthew chapter 5, this is what it says. You have heard the commandment that says... You must not commit adultery. So he's referring back to, way back into the Old Testament, Jesus is referring back, and Exodus and Deuteronomy and and, uh, all those, you know, way, way way back when God gave his original commands to his people. And so he's referring back to that, and uh, because the Old Testament's not dead, okay, that's Jesus himself is quoting it right there, and he is the word that became flesh. And so he says, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye. Can I stop there for a second? Just, just thought of this just now. Like He says if a man looks at a woman with lust. Okay, that doesn't mean that the ladies are off the hook. right? Just wanted to point that out. So if a lady looks at a man with lust... Same thing, okay? So don't think you're like pulled one over on Jesus. Okay. So if you do that, you've committed adultery with her or him uh, in your heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. See, that's weird, right? Um, That's like when you have your your friend come to church the first night, right? This would be the night that they would come, right? They'd be like, I'm never going back there again. You're all are weird cannibals, okay? So... It's the cannibal church. So, uh, so you, you, you gouge out the eye and you throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. So I'm thinking like maybe by the door, instead of like an offering box, we should have like a garbage barrel. So when people are like repenting of sin... They could just leave their eyeball by the door or their hand or something, right? Um, So if it causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Okay, so a little foundation here just so you can understand what's going on here. You know, we just jumped right into the middle of a sermon. Jesus is preaching a sermon up on this hilltop here and he's called his disciples up there and he's teaching them all these different things and he's he's going to quote six old testament laws and he's going to clarify these things so we can understand because these jewish folks a lot of them were keeping the the laws perfectly so 
That's why when you see him talking about it, obviously keeping them perfect isn't quite getting it. You know what I'm saying? Because they were keeping them perfect. And if keeping them perfect was getting it, Jesus would have just said, do what they do. Period, the end, let's pray and go home. But he doesn't do that. He's explaining some things. And these people that he's up on the mountaintop with, you've got to think about this, he's, he's preaching in Israel, right? So what does that mean? That means mostly, if not all the people, are Jewish folks, right? They're Jewish folks, and, and they're not like Sunday morning Christians. See, in our country, we, like if, you, if, if we go to church like twice in a week, you're like a radical, right? You're a radical. And if you like, if you serve in your church, then you're a fanatic. And if you go to like a Bible study on a Sunday night, you're a Jesus freak, right? Amen, right? So, but, but that's our culture, right? I mean, we just got to try to do our best to try to coerce people to go to church. Okay? It's not like that back when Jesus was, was roaming the earth, okay? So if you... If you open up the Bible, you see, like, they had, like, three, or, three o'clock prayer time during the week. Like, they would stop what they're doing, and they would go to the temple, and they would literally go pray. Like, their, their whole culture was centered on their religion. That's what it was. Like, instead of going to school like we do now and learning, like, reading, writing, arithmetic, U.S. history political science and all the things that we, you know, chemistry and, no, you know what they would do with their kids? They would teach them the Torah. Like, if you're going to learn to read, it's because you wanted to read the Bible. That was what they did. Like, so, so since they're all, like, all day long, everyday people, whether you believe what they believed was right or not, they were totally all about that. That Israel was centered around God. It wasn't centered around a constitution or a declaration of independence. It was, it was different. It's not like this. And good or bad, right or wrong, it's just not the way it is now. But those people, that was their whole life. And so it's important to know this because the folks that were with Jesus when he starts talking about things in the Bible, it wouldn't really throw them off. Like when he said, you've heard it said, and he would quote a, a command from God, they weren't all going, really? Like, I never heard that before. You're not supposed to cheat on anybody? Wow, like it was nothing profound when he quoted the word from the Old Testament. What's profound is what he's going to do now. He's going to clarify some things. And everything he quotes from the Old Testament these Jews were pretty familiar with it. And I say that because of who they are, it, it wouldn't be a surprise to them to know this one verse that's in the Old Testament, in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, just so you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the five books of Moses. These people wouldn't be surprised when he quotes something maybe from say, Leviticus, it says it four times in Leviticus, be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. So these people that he's talking to, these Jewish folks, they're not surprised by this. They would be familiar with the things of the Torah because their whole culture was centered on the Torah. Be holy, for I am holy. Peter refers back to this verse in 1 Peter 1.16. He refers back to this verse, and he tells the people in the New Testament time, Be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself in Matthew 5.48 says it a little bit differently, but you'll see it's just the same. He says, Be perfect, therefore, not just because I'm holy. Watch this twist he puts on it. Be perfect, therefore, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. High watermark, right? See, I'm, I'm convinced more and more, I've been doing this now for a while, some of you have been in the church a lot longer than me, but I'm convinced more and more that every single person that goes to church, everyone in this room right now, would love to see the church of Jesus Christ thrive across America. Would you all agree with that? 
nobody's going in here just like poking the, the Jesus doll in here right now, right? You're all for him. You want to see it happen, right? <clears throat> well, the Bible says that it's by his mighty work in you, he can do exceedingly more than you could ever ask or think. Right? You know that he works through you. And so I think more than anything, we're ignoring this call right here. The reason why the church isn't powerful, the reason why the church isn't thriving across America like it should be, I don't think it's because God is weak in any way. Because there are some churches that are absolutely rocking and some communities that are highly impacted by their church that's there. But for the most part, it's not happening. Churches are closing by the thousands. And if they're existing, the average church is 75 people and never really grows past that. And we've kind of hit that kind of thing several times in the life of our church. And you've got to start wondering, why? Is it because of God? Is, is, and, and it's not just this church here. There's many local churches, too, just in this area. There's no shortage of great teachers. And there's no shortage of great facilities. And there's no shortage of great equipment except here. Uh -huh. I don't think that that's it. I think that the reason why churches don't thrive and impact our society the way that they should is not because God lacks in any way, but I believe that it's us, because he works through us. It's our unwillingness to engage our will to this type of holiness that he's asking us to live like. See, I think that when church, people come into a church, they can see great, they can hear great music, they can see great things, they can, hear a, they can hear a good pastor preach a good message. But at the end of the day, what's really gonna make that church thrive in the community? It's you, it's you guys. See, when they walk into a church, they might, you know, you walk into a big church with five, six, 10,000, 15,000 people, that pastor will probably never even meet three quarters of those people. It's not really about him. You know the people meet you? They meet you. When they walk into a church and they meet people that they might, they might say, well, it wasn't the best band in the world. As a matter of fact, the pastor wasn't like my style. He wears funny shoes. They don't have good lighting. I don't like pews. I like chairs. And they'll walk in there and they say, you know what? Those people actually live what it says. They're authentic. And they're living holy lives. That makes a big difference. And see, God can work powerfully through a church like that. He can impact a world through a church like that. And so we need to start taking seriously this idea of being holy for I, the Lord, am holy. And the reason why I say that in tonight's discussion is that it's obvious by reading this <clears throat> that Jesus isn't just simply teaching us, don't cheat on your wife. That is not, that, that's like junior varsity holiness. Awesome, you didn't cheat on your wife. Awesome, great. God wants more than that. This is, he didn't bring them up onto the mountain and teach people, don't cheat on your wife. Most of them probably weren't even married, right? They were smelly, old, crusty fishermen. They probably didn't even have a, couldn't even get a girl. But it, it's more to it than that. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not just don't sleep with her. It's, you know, I just think of the guy who's like sticking out his chest and go, well, I ain't killed nobody yet. You know, while he's drinking like a fish and cussing like a sailor and stealing from his job and cheating on his wife. But I ain't killed nobody yet. Well, congratulations. You haven't slept with anyone yet. Awesome. You didn't commit adultery. You haven't killed anyone. Super, super. I'll buy you a box of cookies. <clears throat> but here's the deal. He says for us to be holy holy as he is holy. And I think, and myself included, like my wife said something to me today about how Moses, I'm proud that you've given your whole life to God. And I cut her right off mid-sentence. And I said, really, I love that you said that, but I really haven't. I really haven't. You know, I might do a lot before your eyes, but there's parts of me that are so not even close to there yet. But God says that's what he wants. You know, Paul talks about this, you know, give your bodies as a living sacrifice. Like, what part of you isn't in your body? Your mind's there. Your heart's there. Your soul's there. Your spirit's there. Your thoughts, your attitude, all that. 
He says, give that, right? That's what holiness is. Be holy as I am holy. So that's what God says. That means your actions and your words and your attitude and your motives and your thoughts. It's like what we call now this holistic approach, right? The full body approach. You know, it's not just a physical thing, but it's, it's going after your mind and your, and your heart, you know, mental stuff, emotional stuff, as well as physical. And that's what Jesus is really talking about here. So when it comes to the issue of adultery, it's way deeper than just the simple physical act of infidelity. As a matter of fact, God says that we commit adultery when we give ourselves over to another for identity, provision, help, purpose, joy, protection, all those things. If you look to anything or anyone else instead of God for those things, that's adultery. Because he wants to be all those things for you. And so when he's talking about don't commit adultery, it's something way, way more than don't cheat on your husband or don't cheat on your wife. Definitely don't want to do that. And, is he ne- and I just want to point this out too, as I have in the last couple of weeks, never does Jesus do away with what he said. He never says, well, you've heard it say, don't commit adultery and, on, on your husband or wife, but I say that doesn't count anymore. It's okay to do that now. Like that never, that was never said. I don't know what translation you, maybe in the message it says it. Just kidding. But, but, but it doesn't say that. The law still stands about cheating on your spouse. But when God's people turn to other things for identity and protection and provision and worship and all that, this is what God said about it. Here's a couple of different Bible verses. I think we have them up. Do we have them up there? Can you put them up? Okay, so you can make note of those because I'm just going to read through them, and I don't want you to have to turn to your Bible because I'm going to try to get through this tonight quickly so we have time to, um, to partake in communion. But this is what God says when people turn to other things for those for identity or protection or joy and start worshiping other things. Jeremiah 3.20 says, But like a woman faithless to her lover, even so have you, become, have you been faithless to me. So we obviously know nobody's sleeping with God. You see? So it's not just the physical act of infidelity that God's talking about when he's talking about adultery. He's talking about giving yourself over to something else other than the one. Ezekiel 6, 9 says, They will recognize how hurt I am by their unfaithful hearts and lustful eyes that long for idols. <clears throat> Here's Ezekiel 16, 30 through 34. It says this. This is kind of tough. What a sick heart you have, says the Sovereign Lord to do such things as this, acting like a shameless prostitute. You build your pagan shrines on every street corner and your altars to idols in every square. In fact, you've been worse than a prostitute, so eager for sin that you have not even demanded payment. Yes, you are an adulterous wife. See, he's talking to people who takes in strangers instead of her husband. Prostitutes charge for their services, but not you. You give gifts to your lovers, bribing them to come and have sex with you. So you are the opposite of other prostitutes. You pay your lovers instead of them paying you. Pretty harsh. Pretty harsh. Over in the New Testament, just so you know that it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever, James 4 Verses 4 through 5 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Choose today whom you will serve, God says. Adultery runs way deeper than the marriage bed. And that's why you see in our text in Matthew chapter 5 that he says in verse 28 that the, adulterous, the adultery is in the heart. 
Adultery is in the heart. Adultery, much like this issue of like this gay marriage thing that people talk about, how dare they? Listen, what happens on the stage at a church between two dudes, that ain't the sin. What goes on in their heart and in a bedroom, that's sin. Okay? I could stand up here right now with Mike and say a bunch of stupid stuff. It's when we commit the sin. You see, adultery happens in the heart. Long before it happened, nobody ever, listen, nobody ever had an affair with on their spouse, and they were walking down the street one day and fell into bed with a woman. It doesn't happen that way. Okay? It's a process. It's a downward spiral into the basement of death. And every single time you take another step, you get closer and closer and closer before it finally happens. And what Jesus is saying is that when it finally happens, that wasn't the problem. The problem started way back here in your heart. When you started looking at the girl a little bit too long and thinking, hey, man, that'd be kind of nice, you know, she's pretty hot. Or, or maybe, maybe it's not that she's super hot. Maybe she just, you know, she likes to fish. And my wife, she doesn't like to fish, you know. So I could talk to, hey, man, I'll talk to you about fishing, right? Hula poppers and jitterbugs. And my wife doesn't want to. So I'll talk to your wife about that. Deep conversations about things, you know. That's, that's the problem. That's adultery. That's adultery. So it's about the heart. That's the target that Jesus is looking for. He's going after that in every single one of these little sections in the Sermon on the Mount. He's going after the person's heart. Because the people were performing the law perfectly. And that's why he's explaining it, because the performing of the law meant nothing. He was going after their heart. Like a spouse being unfaithful or unloyal, not just physically, but in the heart. You know, extended visual fantasies, emotional attachments, you know, that don't need to be happening. Extended Facebook conversations with someone that you're not married to completely inappropriate. Some things are reserved only for your husband or your wife, and to freely give these things to another is absolute adultery. Okay? So I'm just going to say, if anyone's doing that right now, I'm calling you out, and, and I'm telling you in Jesus' name to stop. Just run. Okay? Certainly your sin will find you out, so I guarantee you better stop. And so the same thing is with the Lord as well. Um, Isaiah 54, 5 says this. For your maker is your husband. Isn't that awesome? For your, see, he, we talk about adultery being husband and wife. Don't cheat on your wife. Don't cheat on your husband. And God's saying, hey, I, hey guys, I'm your husband. I'm your husband. So because there's certain things that are only supposed to be shared with your real, you know, here husband or real here wife, same here. God's like, same here. I'm your husband. The Lord of hosts is my name. And in Revelation 19, we're, we, the church, the ones who said yes to Jesus, we're referred to as the bride of Christ. Jesus' bride. God, so what God's trying to do here is he's trying to build loyalty and purity in you. That's what Jesus is doing here on the hill. He's not just quoting laws. They were rocking the laws. He's teaching them about the heart behind the law, the motivation behind the law, the goal of the law, the heart of the law. He's trying to build a holiness into people. This is not a hand or an eye problem here in any way. <clears throat> so when you read it about plucking out the eyes and cutting off the hands, <clears throat> it's really not about those things at all. It's a heart and a will problem. It's not an eye and a hand problem. Okay? Hands and eyes do what the will tell them to do. Do you know that your hand has no real control on its own, right? It doesn't just reach out and grab that Bible on its own. Your brain has to tell it to do it. You don't just go to some woman's house and have an affair. Your will is engaged. I can choose. I can either go into that house or I can go, I'm a moron, I'm stupid, I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm an idiot, and leave and go back to my wife. Like that, there's a, there's a matter of will here. The eye and the hand don't really do anything so on their own. So how do we engage our will? Because eyes and hands don't act on their own. Okay, so here's a bunch of Bible verses. And I'm going to read them to you. 
And again, I don't know that you're going to go there and, and read them with me in the Bible, but I do, I do ask that you would write down the verses and go back during the week and reference them and learn them and be ready for your rev group. Uh, if you don't um, take notes, you can always go back and watch the sermon online. So Romans 13, 14. I'm sorry I'm not as um, animated as I normally enjoy being. I'm just not feeling real good. Romans 13, 14, in some translations, and not in the New Living Translation, but some of the older ones that are really, really good, will say, no, make no provision for the flesh. Just make no provision for the flesh. There's this thing, this, this, this thing in you, your sinful nature, this you, like you want to do bad stuff, right? And, and God's just saying, listen, don't, don't let this, don't let you, don't, gi- don't give him an inch. Did you ever hear someone say that, like, don't give them an inch. If you give them an inch, they'll take two inches. Don't give them a, a foot, they'll take a yard, right? So God's saying that to yourself. He's saying, he's saying, he's saying, Nick, don't give Nick an inch. Don't, don't, no, Tom, don't, don't give yourself an inch. Don't do anything, right? Make no provision for the flesh. Whatever it is that your body wants to do, tell it no, right? You have to take control. You can't just be just be blowing wherever the wind takes you and doing whatever you feel like doing, right? You got to be in the moment. Think. God says, don't, don't give your flesh an inch. Don't let it do anything, right? The New Living says it this way. Clothe yourself with the presence of Jesus. That's so awesome, right? Clothe yourself with the presence of Jesus. Why? If Jesus was right in your face, would you ever cheat on your husband? Ever, right? If I mean, we're tempted sometimes, but if Jesus was there, would you ever do? No, you would never do that. If Je- but see, we, 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 we don't realize because we can't see him, like visually, he's not like skin and bones like we can see Jay. We don't see Jesus anymore, so we don't realize that he is there. But you have to, if you clothe yourself with the presence of Christ, if you're always thinking, "Hey, Jesus is here." Jesus is here, and you're talking to, how many people are going to literally go in and have an affair with another while you're praying, right? If you're sitting there doing, if you're on your knees doing the Lord's Prayer, are you going to be like, oh, you know, our Father who art in heaven, let me put on some porn for a second, here, let's just watch that, I mean, you know what I mean, like, no one's going to do that, so he's like, put, clothe yourself in the presence of Jesus, and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge evil desires. Like, they're coming, so just always set your eyes on Jesus. If you're thinking about Jesus, if you're in his word, if you're praying, if you're in your house, and you, every week I put that song list on for you guys, right? Karen sings it. I hope you guys do. If not that, put on some worship music. Who's going to, whatever your sin is, who's going to do that while you're busting out vertical church songs in your living room with your hands held to, to heaven? Right? But, but people don't, they, that's reserved for church, man. This ain't Sunday morning. It's always Sunday morning. It's Sunday morning right now. You know what I'm saying? Like it's always Sunday morning. We have to clothe ourselves in the presence of Jesus because if we're focusing on Jesus and we're worshiping Jesus and we're praying to Jesus and we're reading Jesus' words, how much time do you have to be committing adultery? You're not going to be doing that. And so when he talks about, you know, be holy as I am holy, he's talking about every part of you. And that's what I refer back to the church as being weak and not as powerful as they could. If God's people did that, not just a good idea, oh, that sounds good. No, like, we really, really did that. What would happen when people came into this church and and we were a people that literally just got so fed up with the stuff we fill our schedule with that really has not much redeeming value? And started clothing ourselves in the presence of Christ more and more every day. 
What would our worship experiences look like? What would our visitors experience? What would our church be like when God looks back and forth and sees a group of people whose heart are completely his? What would he do? I want to find out. (laughs) I want to find out. I don't know about you, but that's what I want to find out. Romans 6, 12 through 13 says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. See, there's your will right there again. So we have a will. We have a will. Free will. Right, Nick? We got free will. We do. And we can make decisions in the moment. Isn't that a surprise? It's a surprise to hear from the pulpit, right? You can actually make better choices. He says, do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part... We're all waiting around for, hey, God, would you just please help me not to do this? God, would you help me to do that? Well, that's awesome. He already gave you that help when, he, when his, his Holy Spirit indwelled you. So when you look at the Bible, is he saying, hey, God's going to do this? What's he saying? I refer back to this thing I did a long time ago all the time about the dance. He puts his spirit inside of you. He's leading you. Now you've got to do something. He says, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. This is your will. Now the spirit of God lives in you. The word of God spoke to you. Now your will needs to be engaged. What are you going to do with that? Right? That's what it's saying. Don't do this. Don't let it become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Okay, I won't. Instead, okay, what do I do then? Uh, Instead, give yourselves completely to God. Who's the only person, show your hand, who's the only person that can decide that for you? You. Don't wait on your pastor. Don't wait on your wife. Don't wait on your kids. Don't wait for a better career. Don't wait for more money. Don't wait for a different church. You can do that right now. Instead, give yourself completely to God. And I don't know what that looks like for you, but I know what it's like for me. And I am passionately going to be working on this now. I got stuff about me that needs to go. See, it says, for you were dead, but now, this is a good one, you ready? It's a good place for an amen. I'm tired, but that doesn't mean you have to be. For you were dead, but now you have new life. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so now that you have new life, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, behold, a new man. So now that you have a new life, use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. That's what we do. So we, when the flesh says, I want this, you go, no, but I'm going to do this. Because I know this is what you want, Lord, for the glory of God. And, and I wish I could get up here, you know, and I, I, I don't remember who I was talking to yesterday, maybe. Yeah, I don't even know. Who. Someone was talking about. Charles Stanley back in the day, you know, like God wrote it, the Holy Spirit inspired it, but Charles Stanley preached it, so I better do it. You know what I mean? I'm not that guy. I'm not that fancy. I don't know how to do it. I can just say this. It's that simple. And people have left this church because I say that. And I don't care. It's that simple because God's word says it's that simple. I'm not making anything up. You can choose whether you're going to Lose, use any part of your being, any, any part of your will to be an instrument to serve sin or you can use it for a better thing, to serve God. I mean, it, it, and the only reason why I say that is not because I've achieved it, so I'm like, man, I, if you guys could get where I'm at, you know, you'd know. It's totally not that. I'm only saying this because I believe that God's word is true and that's what it says. And so it doesn't matter what I think or feel because most of the time I don't, totally don't feel this way. I feel like a complete and utter failure sometimes, right? All of us. But God's word says that you can make this choice, so that means you must be able to. So here's another one. It's one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. And uh, it's it's Isaiah 50, verse 7. But before I get there, I I just want to uh, tell you about this. Um, I guess it was like last year. I went up to Massachusetts, and I have a, a buddy who's a pastor of, um, what's it called, North 
Dighton Christian Church. Philip Andre is his name. Great guy, man. Loves the Lord. It's this little podunk town with nothing in it. It's like one little greasy spoon restaurant and a gas station. Like, that's it. And he has such a heart for the Lord, and he wants to do good, and he wants to spread the gospel and all that. Anyway, I went up there last year, and I got the chance to preach in this church, which was a great privilege. But while before I got to preach there, I was up there for a couple days, and I just hung out with him for a day, and, and he, he took me around town and showed me around, and he showed me this huge rock in the woods. We pulled over on the side of the road and walked down into the woods, and I thought he was going to kill me, but he didn't. And um, anyway, we, we um, went into the woods, and we saw this, this big, massive boulder. You see it there? I'll put a picture up there on the screen for you. Isn't that fancy? So that's, um, that rock is, uh, I don't know if it has a name, but supposedly there's a story there that back when there was this fighting between the, you know, the, the colonists and the Indians and stuff, the Indian tribes up there, there were the Wampanoag Indians, and there was this chief called uh, Amawan, and Amawan was supposedly sleeping. Um, I don't know if you can really see it, but see that kind of black spot in the middle of the rock? And it almost looks like this little shelf right there. You see it? So supposedly he was sleeping right there when the, the Confederate, I mean, when the, um, when the um, soldiers, it was, this, it was um, King Philip's War is what it was called. But this guy named Benjamin Church captured him, and that was the end of the fight between the colonists and the Indians up there. And that was back in 1676. Like, that was a long time ago, you know, when that happened. And now here we are in 2018, and every single day, no matter the conditions, no matter the weather, no matter the time, you go into that spot into the woods, and that rock is there. Just a big old massive boulder. And that's the way we need to be. Isaiah says it this way, 50 verse 7, I set my face like stone, determined to do his will. Just like that boulder, man. Year after year, no matter the situation, no matter the time of year, no matter the weather, no matter what, you walk into that, down that path, and you're going to see that boulder. It never changes. It doesn't alter. No one's changing its mind. It's sitting there, year after year, unchanging. And that's what God says we have to do. We have to make a choice whether we're going to use our body to practice sin or use our body to practice righteousness and it's something we have to make a decision to stick with. It's not a, I decide today and then I break it tomorrow. It's, who are you? If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, there's a new person. So we have to make a decision and then stick with it. Set my face like stone, determined to do his will. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, the New American Standard says, I discipline my body. See, God knows that there's a fight going on. Because you want to sin, I want to sin, where it's our nature to do that. It's just easy to default into that, you know. And so God knows that, so he addresses this issue with the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he says, I discipline my body and I make it my slave. You know what I mean? It's like, so if, if, the, if the will is weak and all of a sudden the hand goes to sin, what Paul says is, I, I, I like, like a taskmaster, I, I, I just whip that thing. No! No! I discipline myself. I make myself a slave. I, no, flesh, you're not going to tell me what to do. Okay, I'm not going to do this. I've made a decision, I've set my face like stone, this is who I am now, and I'm not going back. That's what you're supposed to do. Take your sin seriously. Do something about it. Get radical about it. He said, and this is Paul, who doesn't want to be a hypocrite. And I don't want to be a hypocrite. So he says, I discipline my body and I make it a slave so that after I've preached to others, hey, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. Set your face like stone, dude. Set your face like stone while I go cheat on my wife. 
That's what Paul is saying here. Listen, I need to discipline my body. I'm a pastor. I love the Lord. I've been studying his word. He spoke to me. He sucked me up to the third heaven. But even so, I have to discipline myself, make no provision for the flesh, set my face like stone, and I'm not going to do this because I preach to you not to do it. Now everyone's looking at me, and I don't want to fail the Lord. So after I've preached to others, I myself would not be disqualified. So Paul says, Psalm 101.3, King James, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of don'ts so far, but this is what we should do. Well, this is actually a don't. <clears throat> I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I will set no wicked, like a, it's a determination, man, my stomach is hurting me, Whoo! <clears throat> it's a determination of my will that I am not, I'm not going to, you know, I, listen, I, I like a pretty girl like anybody else, any other dude, man. But I've had to discipline myself that when I, because we all catch them, right? No guy in here is going to be that awesome and say, well, I don't even notice pretty girls. You're lying, okay? They walk into your view, you're going to see them. But you have to discipline your body to when it comes and you see it, you go, same thing, right? Same thing. So, so uh, are the handsome guys coming? Of course, right? They're coming. What are you going to do with that? I discipline my body and make it a slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself wouldn't be disqualified. Because I, you guys shouldn't look at other, you know, that's not your spouse, and Right? But then you're driving down the highway, and you see me in my car, and I'm just checking out some chick, just rubbernecking like crazy, right? What's that going to do to our church? You want to go to that church? Do you? I wouldn't want to go to that church, right? So when I find myself in a situation with a, a, an attractive woman, I have had to train myself and continue to do so to look away. Because I can't sleep with her if I've never looked at her. You get me? So the adultery doesn't happen in the bedroom. The adultery happened the moment I started gazing at her too long, and I didn't control my body and make it a slave to righteousness. That's when adultery started, right then and there. <clears throat> we have to make some choices. And so I would ask you this. We're talking about not just adultery bedroom-wise. We're talking also adultery with God. And so, what are you giving your time to that God deserves? What are you giving your money to that belongs to God? What are you giving your attention to? So two, two forms of attention. What are you looking at? And what are you thinking about? I'm not talking about right this second. You're probably thinking about this. That's great. I'm talking about during the normal course of the day. Whew, man, that hurts me so much. Whew. It's not so much that your hand or your eyes cause you to sin, but it's your will that allows them to. So we have to make some choices. And notice here it says, um, even your good eye, even your strong hand, what is that? Causes you to sin. Tells you to get rid of those things, right? If it's your good eye, pluck it out. If it's your good hand, you know, I'm a lefty. So that would be my good hand, right? That's the one I do most things with. I write with that and brush my teeth with that and shave with that and eat with that. But even if that, you know, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, we know it's not the hand or the eye that causes the sin. It's the will that allows it to. <clears throat> and since there's really no biblical precedence for masochism and self-mutilation, I'm only left to believe that it's 
whatever's good in your life but that's hindering the great, you get rid of it. You get rid of it. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says it this way. It speaks right to this. It says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Okay? Don't let me forget the second part of this. But I just want to point something out to you. Like, you know, in John 15 where it talks about you know, I'm, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, my father's the vine dresser, and he prunes back the branches that are producing fruit, you know, they're doing good, but I want more fruit out of you, so I'm going to prune it back. And we know that principle works in regular plants, right? We know that. See, this is what's happening here. So God doesn't just walk around with a pair of loppers, you know, in the supernatural and walk by you and go, oh, I don't like that, snap, and I don't like that, snap. The way that God prunes back branches is through verses like Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. By helping you to identify things in your life that are hindering your relationship going forward with God. And as a matter of your will, deciding, I'm getting rid of that. I make the choice. Because God has identified it through his spirit that this thing that I am giving myself over to is getting in the way of my relationship with God. You see, not everything is sinful. He's, like, we obviously get rid of sin, like we know that, but look what he says here. He says, strip off every weight, especially the sin. So there's things that you need to get rid of that aren't necessarily sin. How many people like fishing? You like fishing. I really like fishing, right? Bill, you love fishing. You love fishing, right? Is there anything sinful about fishing? What if it got in the way of your spending time in prayer, time in the word, time in church, time in serving, you know, all that? What if you're spending your offering on fishing, Lord? That'd be bad, right? So is fishing bad? Not at all. But if it gets in the way, right, if it's a weight, so you're still running the race, you're still getting there, but you got these fishing lures hung on your pants, right, and they're, and they're snagging stuff. As you're trying to go towards the Lord, the, your fishing lures are snagging stuff because you shouldn't have bought them because you're offering what you didn't. You get it? See, these things that get in the way. They're not necessarily bad. They're good things, but what he's saying here is, what good things in your life stand in opposition to God? And you got to think about these things. And, and the thing is, is in, in America, it just, this is a very important message because this wouldn't even mean anything to, like, the starving kids in Ethiopia. They have nothing. They have nothing. If they could get a glass of water today, that would be, like, massive. You know, they could get a, a carrot. They would be, that would lo- be life-changing. But think of all the things that are grabbing at you for your attention. Grabbing at you for you to pour your resources into them. All the stuff in our culture is calling your name like crazy. So what person, place, or thing gets more of you than God does? What do you give your resources over to so freely and so passionately and so consistently other than Jesus? Thoughts, time, money, praise. Where does your identity lie? What about your career, your family, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Whether you're even an American, maybe that's your big identity. Maybe it's because you're handicapped. Maybe it's because you're a Gator fan. Maybe it's the stuff that you gather frantically. Maybe it's iPhone. Maybe it's cars. Maybe it's the way you look. 
See, God wants us to love him with all of our mind, heart, soul, and strength, but we lust after other things. You know, the lust is just a distortion of love. Do you understand that? See, lust is totally, it, it's, it's, it's so close, it's, 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 like it's like a close cousin to love. Love, <clears throat> love has an attractional element to it completely. But lust is, is the removal of restraint and the removal of the, the heart and, and, and soul from that attraction. You know, it's, it's um, that looks good. Hey, that tastes great. That'll be fun. I want it. And, and, and so basic craving desires begin to rage just because you, you see something that you like or you want something because it would feel good and it's totally different than love. When you love, it involves your mind, heart, soul, and strength. It's not just the, the, the animalistic craving of a, oh, I want that. Because it'll feel good, it'll taste good, it'll be good. Love is different. And that pertains to your marriage, too. See, when you make love, right, when you make love with a spouse, it's the two becoming one. In the Hebrew, that meant the mingling of souls. You didn't just, pardon me, enter a woman. It was the mingling of souls. The reason why marriage is so destroyed in our country is because we took what God originally designed of one man with one woman, they come together, the two become one, you guys know what I'm talking about, and it was for life. But everyone in this room, we've all had a lot of husbands and wives, myself included. And I've done what all human beings do with all that God gives. We have food, we overeat. We have wine, we overdrink, right? We have sex, we oversex. And that's the problem. When you make love, it is supposed to be not just a physical act of intimacy. It should engage your heart and your mind and your soul. It's a spiritual thing. I don't want to be funny, but the oh my God during sex, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about thanking God with your spouse afterwards for the amazing intimacy that you feel with one special person. I don't want to let you guys into my bedroom stuff goes on in my head. It's my love of life. I happen to lust after it too, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> but that's what's supposed to happen. This is a, this is, con love is connecting at every level. The mind, the heart, the soul, and the physical. <clears throat> Making love is as much an emotional and spiritual experience as it is physical. And so, when there's love, not lust, that means you love one. And there's no porn on the side. There's no deep conversations with other, you know, other people of the opposite sex other than your spouse. There's no financial gifts or supports being funneled off to other people, other mysterious families. By no means are you to be spending time alone with someone of the opposite sex, if you're married, having lunches and dinners and talking about things that should only belong to your husband or wife. Holiness in marriage means all of me to you and you alone. That's, that's holiness in marriage. But holiness with God is loyalty of affection and praise and thought and time and identity and purpose and ultimate fulfillment in God and to God only. And like I said, since there's no biblical precedent of physical self-mutilization here, Jesus isn't speaking literally here about eyes and hands being removed. He's saying as an act of your will, Remove the things in your life 
Even the good things that you may like that are warring against your holiness. It's time to prune back the things that are getting in the way of my relationship with you. And so, um, Tom, if you, wherever Tom, Tom, if you can come up and we're going to worship here in a moment. I'm probably not going to worship with you. I'm going to go run in the other room. But I just want to say in closing, I want to remind you that the enemy of your soul, the world system that you live in, especially here in our country, which is a beautiful place and I love it, but it's very attractive in a lot of different ways. And yourself, your flesh, all three are trying to drag you into hell. I mean, that's, he's quite clear here. He's talking about if this causes you to sin, it's better to get rid of something than to have your whole body be thrown into hell. These are harsh, hard words, right? Which means it, 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 it requires a, a radical response. You know what I'm saying? This is not like, hey, if you do this stuff, you're going to have a bad day. <laughs> He's saying that if, this, if these things are causing you to sin, it's better to get rid of them rather than your whole body being thrown into hell. And I don't think that we should just like, well, you know, that's not really what he means. No, I mean, he, if it wasn't what he means, he wouldn't have said it. He's Jesus. I don't know if you do any Bible reading, you know he's not like at a loss of words. Ever. Ever, 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 ever.